from Barry Consultants. We're going to use a senior statistical scientist. She statistical scientist. And she uh, is with expertise in phase one, two, and three clinical trial design analysis and reporting to the data monitoring committee. She received her PhD in biometry in 2003 from the University of Texas Houston School of Public Health. Prior to joining Barry Consultants in 2011, Dr. Jeffrey was an assistant scientist in the Department of Biostatistics and Medical Informatics in the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health. Without further ado, we are going to chat about And also because you may be positive generating, you're going to have a subsequent study 
that you're going to use a third panel for the reproducibility of your results. So your type one level, the amount of error you're willing to accept should be set in the context of your study question. <coughs> Let's say you have a randomized trial and you have four active doses of the new drug and then you have the fifth arm, which is your control placebo arm. 
And your goal is really to see if the measuring would work. So do you blindly go in and you say, I want to compare each act to the control so we do the forecast? But let's say, let's think a little bit further about this. Let's say our doses were actually ordered with placebo arm, which is no treatment, and then we had a one, two, three, four milligram dose. And let's say you got the trial, and you just say, okay, I want to know if I had treatment back, and I do my forecast comparing the arms uh, to the control, and I see key values of 0 0.2, 0 0.18, 0 0.04, and 0.3. Looking at that, would you get excited and believe that dose three is the only effective dose? Thought about the question. No, I probably wouldn't. And the question is, would other people believe it? So the key here is in the context of the situation, you will test. You've got the other doses here. You probably have to find the one in the middle that was significant. And it's not the match level, but it doesn't seem plausible. So you need to think of the context of this question in the background here. What was the research question and what was the study designed to answer? So really when I started looking at this, I was looking at four doses because I was thinking there was going to be some sort of dose response. As the dose got higher, maybe I would see more of an effect. And, um, and so comparing each dose simply to control wasn't really answering the question. So I know in all the group sessions, the thing we start with is we spend a lot of time talking about what is the question, what is the question, and a lot of refinement that way. And you find as the work with statisticians, we spend a lot of time also asking, what is your question? Um, and it's not to uh, be difficult. It's one, because we want to understand the question, but the other thing is we want to design a study so you can, un you can answer your question at the end. And we can think about all these issues as far as multi testing is the best way to answer them. So the big thing is, what is the question? So I was hoping here, I had four doses, that there would be some sort of dose response and the dose increases. So simply comparing each one to control, didn't really address the question, so my message here, my message over and over again, mm -hmm. don't find the lift by key values, don't just get excited because you're seeing a key value of the search. So you need to think about these issues um, and the study question while designing your trial and writing your protocol. And so what I would have done in this situation is I would have pre-specified how I'm going to pick the best dose. Maybe my question is not just to see if there is just a significant difference between my active and control. Maybe my question is to look at my which doses have the highest probability of being maximum effectiveness. And maybe this is a situation where I don't need to pick one dose. Maybe I want to pick two doses. Because I was thinking, hey, what's next? I'm going to have a confirmatory study, some sort of follow-up trial. And so in that situation, I want to compare my best or my better doses to the standard of care control. So I'm going to pick two of those forward. So my question wasn't to see do I have a significant improvement care control. My question really is to think about the doses so that I can move forward and have a confirmatory trial and hopefully have some reproducibility of the evidence of that kind of disease. All right, let's talk about subgroups. So again, we have randomized study and we're comparing intervention A to the standard of care. At the end of the trial, if we really, we really thought this was going to work, we had done all the work ahead of time, we had the mechanism was in place, we thought this was going to be effective, we get done and we didn't have to but you've got lots of data here. How many people have um, participated in a phase, or sites participated in a phase three trial, and you've seen all the ECRFs that you fill out? There's lots of them, right? So you've got lots and lots of information coming in. So you got done. I didn't have my primary question. I didn't find an association. But I've got lots of data. I know there's got to be something going on. So it's tempting just to start parsing the data and start looking. So you start saying, okay, maybe, and this is a total hypothetical example, maybe I should have just looked at males. Maybe this doesn't tell me a lot of females. Didn't see anything. Oh, let's look further. Maybe they need to be older. Maybe they need to be males. Maybe they need to be greater than 50. Okay, well, that, I didn't find anything there. Well, let's add on parsing further to add in subjects with pre existing disease acts. Boom, I see an effect of the intervention. I see the diagnosis of 25. Do you believe that? You may be able to go back, I think Roger talked about that we can rationalize these associations and actually go through and create a rational argument for why this may be true, but I would consider it very, very suspect and the chance of it being reproducible may be small. It does mean you don't have something, it just needs you to, you need to understand and report it in the context of how you found it. You did some data diving, you went through and you kind of parsed until you found this population and it's very important for people outside of what you did to know how you it wasn't pre-specified ahead of time. You 
and no mechanism or biological argument for why these children's population do start to die in data. And these are all real situations that they're attempting, and all situations I've seen. So again, it's kind of things that I just said. So you get this result and you want to publish it. And the big question is how should you bring the result in the context of all the self-group parents that you did? So if you do, you need to be honest and say what you did. Um, because reproducibility is extremely important. Someone looks at this and makes a decision that they're going to go and uh, think this treatment is effective in this particular cell group. You want them to know the context of how you found this result. Hopefully, because it's exploratory, there's going to be a follow-up study actually designed to look in the specific population to see if there actually is an effect of this intervention. Uh, and you want to have all that information available so that any reader can understand the context of the result designed to the credibility. All right, multiple testing. So, uh, and this is this is one that I saw a lot. You have a trial that's going on. Half the subjects are enrolled, and the data is out is collected. You didn't plan ahead that you were going to do any sort of interim look at the data, which is fine. You were just running the system again. But you look and you get the announcement that an abstract deadline is coming up in two weeks, and you really, really want to submit. Your trial is going to be done when the conference happens, but the abstract deadline is not. So you really want to get a slide in there and have a talk. So you're tempted to look at your data, analyze your data. You see something interesting. You see a significant association. You see a magic feed out of the bottom. Or you see a strength of evidence that gives you a good question. You didn't plan to do this analysis halfway through. Should you take this information and submit it to get an abstract data to present at the conference? And this is it's a tough question. I just have the time to get all this bit. And then you think, okay, I'm just going to submit now. I saw something going on. I know this is going to hang on. There's not going to be a change. There's not going to be a fresh post in the end of my study continues. And then I'll just update the results when I present my post story to my top of the conference. Well, you actually you run a great risk of getting into a situation where you get to the conference and things are completely changed. You didn't plan for this analysis. You didn't plan for the strength of evidence you would need in an early book to say that something is going on, to say that their treatment is effective. You just did analysis at the normal level you would have done at the end. If you're going to have an intermediate look at the data, it needs to be planned out ahead of time. And it's probably going to require a stronger level of evidence to be able to claim your results than it would have been the Okay, multiple tests, that guy. Another one. And this is one of Um, this is one that actually uh, I actually see. Um, I don't have all the details. Actually, I don't even remember all the details. But the actual situation I'm involved in. So we have this project. We have a continuous outcome, and I don't even remember what it was. But let's say maybe it was like LDL level or something like that. This was some sort of treatment for LDL. Um, I'm a statistician. I can think of the example of the whole range. So there was a measure of some sort of blood level. And want to see if there was a difference in our outcome, our continuous outcome, based upon good and bad blood levels. Maybe it was a, a liver enzyme test, maybe it was red blood cells, I don't know, I don't remember what it was. But there was some way that this predictor variable was going to be characterized to see if there was association with that outcome. So I was working with a clinician and we had this first definition. I said, okay, you want your, you say that this variable needs to be categorized as good and bad. How we want to categorize that. And we discussed it at length and decided it was okay based on the data, maybe the 75th percentile of, um, uh, like above that was going to be bad, half of it was bad, or We did that, we did the analysis, got the result once again. The, the collaborator I was working with, she was disappointed. She said, no, 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 we shouldn't use that definition. We shouldn't use upper limit of normal in this blood test to define whether or not it was bad. So I listened and I'm like, okay, this is kind of an objective definition. I understand that. Okay, let's go ahead and do it again. Um, I should also tell you that the first result that you value was, you know, maybe 0.5 or something. This next result actually we moved the threshold down a little bit. We got maybe a few value of 0.1, which is kind of we're getting closer and closer and closer to that magic 0.5, but it still wasn't significant. Set the result of the position. She came back and said, no, 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 that wasn't the cup we should have done. We should have done this other one which was a further lowering, and you could kind of tell where we were going here, that we were going and trying to find where we could find significant results. We were trying to use PHAC. We wasn't called PHAC, but that's what I wish I had that term. Um, so what I said to her was, I said, OK, I'll do this test if when you report the results in the paper, you report the results of all three tests. She, I told her to now, so I couldn't see her reaction. She wasn't 
wasn't very happy with me, and she said, no, we won't do it. And I said, okay. But the important question here is, if we would have just gone in and reported that third result based upon this arbitrary cut point that was selected by going through the data and looking at it, we were key hacking, and there wasn't really a plausible reason for why we chose that one selection of good and bad, and without presenting it in the context of what we were looking at and how we got to that, the leaders wouldn't have really not really had the appropriate knowledge to on the input. So real life situation. And I don't think we collaborated again. <laughs> But my concern was not to be difficult. My concern was the scientific credibility of the analysis. All right, let's talk about another example. And let's say we have a big double line randomized problem. Uh, we've got two arms intervention control, and let's say our outcome is measured in three months. We really want to, let's say you've got taken three years, you really have this temptation, you want to look at the data online and see whether something's going on early during the trial to determine if you can stop early for success. And so therefore, you're going to have multiple inner analyses, multiple tests. Well, one thing that we talked about this before, the probability of uh, taking a significant result at a point of significance level, this is a variable thing, or not, but like I said, the more shots we take, the more looks at the data, the more chance we have to find something that's going on. Not necessarily result of something going on, it's a result of the fact that you won't be going on. But this doesn't mean that you can't have the data, that you can't have an urban analysis in your trial. It's just the context of how you do it and what level of evidence you require and the different an urban analysis, and that is specified ahead of time by Dr. Design. So this isn't to say, no, you can never have an urban analysis. Obviously, I wouldn't say that because I work a lot in that trial, so I think you should be able to do this. But this is all well thought out in the design and well thought out in the planning process. So something to think about if you're going to do an early interim analysis, and I'm talking calling these interim analyses because I'm looking at it in the context of stock growth and success. Um, I'm not thinking of other adaptations that you might have to try updates where you might update the randomization probability like Jason now uh, talked about yesterday. But you've got these early and interim analyses where you're considering stock growth and success. The level of evidence you're going to want is going to be different than those later on or at the end of the trial. You're going to want, if you're going to stop early, you're going to stop this trial early, you're going to want a high level of evidence or a higher level of evidence to say, I really know what's going on. And the, like, the likely chance that this is going to change by the end of the trial is um, not going to happen. Bob was just talking about the other example that he wants to know the probability that the study is going to be a success at the end. You're thinking of, so you're thinking about this level of evidence early on in the day you have it now, whether it's going to change um, early on, whether it's going to be something like early. So how do you handle the interim analysis for involving decisions? There are many acceptable methods. There are the standard, um, there are standard use function designs. There are many, many different adaptive designs that are completely tailored to the function. Many ways to do this is completely reasonable, but it requires pre-planning. Pre it requires things about this ahead of time, this thing's done before you start your study, and needs to be all planned out well. Stopping early for success, making the early plan, is going to require a high level of evidence and early interrupts and late interrupts. And you have to pre-specify completely the details of the design. Um, and this, so this is kind of me standing in my soapbox a little bit. I know I'm talking about the testing, but now I'm also talking about different analyses. You need to specify in the interim analyses these need to be planned ahead of time. You need to specify what decisions you make based on what you see this all to specify. You need to account for increased type of error by having the additional things in the data. You need to account for performance and line analyses, many other logistic considerations. This is all put in a protocol ahead of time so that it can be it can be left by a robot or you don't This is not something that's done on the fly that you want to get inside. So uh, Kirk's going to talk tomorrow about trial simulation, which is very important for these type of designs and very important. <coughs> so a little plug for Kurt's talk about those. Okay, let's give an example. We've got a clinical trial for a genetic brain injury, and we're looking at experimental treatment versus standard care. And we're not sure how fast the treatment needs to be administered, but we think sooner is better. And so within our population, we're going to have people that got the treatment within two hours after the injury, and we're going to have other people that got it two to 12 hours after the injury. And what we want to do is we want to compare the active treatment to the standard of care, but we want to look at both these subpopulations. So as we think about this, we're like, okay, I've got two tests, but what happened here? 
So let's say in the situation you had decided a tech one over five percent was possible, and so we have the two texts, and so we do have an increased chance of making a tech one error. We need to think about this with multiple tests, and we want to need to adjust them. How many people have heard of the bottom floor adjustment? Fantastic. It's a um, it's a very it's a it's a way to adjust for multiple tests, but it's a very harsh method. Um, but it, it, it is a reasonable method. If you would do a bond for one adjustment on it, you would take your type one and error rate, you would divide by your number of tests, and that would be your threshold for declaring a, a statistically significant result. So in this case, you have 5% divided by 2, or a new threshold, start the level of evidence is at 2.5%. So you're thinking about the ahead of time, so now you have a higher level of evidence, you're thinking back to your sample size and power calculations. And you need to enroll more subjects now to keep the power that you want for your study at this threshold, which you're going to have two tests. So there's a consequence of having these two tests. But we didn't think about it all here in the context of the question. Let's think deeper about the study question. And I can think further think, would you think that giving the intervention quicker would yield better results? Yes. So if the intervention didn't work in the zero to two hour subgroup, would you think that that longer after a two to 12 hours would work if you were based on this whole mechanism that's going to better? In this situation, probably not. So instead of using a harsh bond for adjustment, maybe we can do a different method to account for multiple tests. And one of the options would be to actually test the active treatment versus control and start this in that zero to two hour group. If it's significant, then we're going to test the next group. So we kind of have to gate the activity where you're reporting it. This is thought about ahead of time, it's pre-specified in the protocol, and it actually preserves the power for the comparison in the two hour group. And it can be shown that it preserves the type one error rate. So the point here is there are methods for adjusting for multiple tests. You don't have to automatically do a harsh bond for correction. There are methods. But again, you need to go back to the context of your question. So overall message, how to handle multiple schemes. I mean, there is a, it, it's very complicated. If you read the paper, it's very complicated. Uh, there's, there's different opinions on how um, how much you need to be worried about doing multiple tests. Um, there's even a quote from a different author who says um, that you should that it's, it's not as worrisome to do kind of uh, uh, many tests in certain situations like Ken Rothman. I'll tell you to do that. Um, but how to handle it is you need to put a lot of thought into defining your study question. You need to think about what do I want to be able to say when I'm done and select a primary aim and a primary outcome design your study to be able to answer those questions. If you can, limit this question to a single goal because it's going to be a lot easier to handle if you don't have to worry about multiple adjustments. If you don't, if you have multiple goals that are both primary and multiple by, that's fine. You're just going to have to make sure you design your study to answer all your questions. You can have other aims. This doesn't mean this is the only thing you can look at. But your aims are going to be second. The other aims are secondary and exploratory aims. And you may not have the same level of evidence required. It's going to be very difficult to design a study to meet a level of evidence for all these different things that they want to look at. So that's why you really focus on what's the most important thing, what, what questions you really want to answer first, but of course there are other things that you want to look at. Pre-specification is important. Uh, your scientific credibility will be increased if things are pre-specified ahead of time. Define your primary and secondary analysis in the protocol. If you're going to look at subgroups, if you have specific subgroups of interest, by the time of the phone call. There's a lot more credibility that can be done if you can find the same result in your different association. If you have all the tests, describe how you're going to handle these. Or if there are going to be no adjustments made, then why are there are no adjustments made? When reporting your results, be very clear how you arrive at your results. I gave you that example where we were doing three tests and test shifting, how you find good and bad until it's not the same as your result. You need to be clear how you got them. Was this the primary analysis? Was it exploratory and multiple subgroup analyses where I kept dicing the data until I found a significant result? And how many subgroups did you examine? Did you do 10? Did you do 50? Um, were the subgroups pretty fine? Put that all in there so that the results can be interpreted correctly and don't overstate. Reproduce the reproducible research is the goal here. And if you don't state how you came about these, then be careful on not overstating something. Uh, it's, it's a, the inference may not be justified in having the results. Um, I should also, in addition to talking about bias and data, I should also mention there was um, uh, John Oliver on uh, last week's night at HBO. I couldn't show all these clips up here because sometimes there's some colorful language in it. But 
but he has a nice little piece on science that I really like. And um, he talks about be happy and talks about science in general and um, uh, press releases and spinning of results. And it, it's really good. So I, I highly recommend you to watch it. But it's just, as a statistician, it's kind of fun to see these, these pieces that tie in directly to what we do and we think um, are done well. But that ties into interpreting correctly, not overstating. And if you do have a multiplicity issue, there are different statistical methods that can be done. This isn't something that can't be done. There are methods that can be done. Usually, it's going to require more evidence, um, a higher probability of results to do. So the main story is limiting, you know, the probability of results due to chance of one one. So, but when you do this and you do the adjustments for um, the multiple tests, there are going to be consequences. Like I talked about the other study where we did a first block growing adjustment. Um, it, uh, we had a higher threshold to be. Therefore, it lowered our power, so we had to increase our sample size to maintain the power we wanted. So there are going to be consequences. Uh, there are like these, you might have a situation where there are going to be much more type 2 errors where you conclude that there's not in fact what it really was, even if you just see something. So you need to balance your desire, everything's a balance, you balance the multiple tests when you come. So in summary, if it's complicated, prepare your protocol in advance, specify your primary aims. In your publications and summaries, you clear what was found through pre specified analysis and analysis. And you need to keep track of anything you analyze. You often see these big studies that are done, and you'll see maybe seven, eight, ten papers come out. And when you find a paper, or maybe something you're looking at, and you don't see the context of there were seven or eight other papers published. So if you're going to do a piece of a large study that was exploratory, you need to be clear that there were seven other studies that were published. Just so the reader has a context of this is exploratory, um, I need to take this with caution. Yes, there is maybe very, very valuable to see something going on here, but they need to be in the appropriate context. So keep track of everything you analyze, um, adjust where warranted, but it's better to focus during the design phase to minimum the need to adjust statistically. If you want your results to be reproducible, I've said that how many times. Um, if the results are exploratory, you can need another study to confirm the actual design. And keep your results carefully in the context of the research question, the perspective biological rationale, previous published results. And again, if there are multiple publications, be clear about all the analyses and the publications that are planned so that the reader that may find your publication in isolation can have the, the right context. So what I do is when I have the situation where it's an exploratory analysis, I kind of have the little play language that I put in papers or I suggest people put in protocols to make it very clear to the reviewers of the study section that I understand that these analyses are exploratory. And I will actually say, these are, these are exploratory analyses. We did no adjustments for the multiple tests. The results will be interpreted with caution due to the multiple testing. Now, I do like, you know, there was this recent from the um, American Statistical Association, a statement came out on p-values recently. And um, the founder of our company, also the author of the paper, Don Barry, wrote uh, an online piece <coughs> And I actually like his boilerplate language, his black box warning that he put it together. And so I brought it up here so I can read it well. And he, um, his black box warning um, quote is, our study is exploratory and we make no claims for generalizability. Statistical calculations such as p-dollars and confidence are descriptive only and have no inferential content. And I really like that one. I know it's a very strong statement, but I think it gives the actual context to um, the results. And so you um, really know that if you try to read so um, I was wondering if you could comment on how you think this should be reviewed from you know, the perspective of like, the review committee and the NIMDS as a funding agency itself. Um, as an example, I, I I study a rare disease, chocolate stroke, and so I did a large study that cost the NIH six million dollars to study chocolate stroke. And so then, when we went to renew the study, one of the comments from the reviewers was, "Before we give you <coughs> another several million dollars to study chocolate stroke, we want you to go back and like do more with the data you." and answer more questions for the data you have. And so on the one hand, that makes sense in terms of, you know, 
fiscal responsibility, making the most out of data, and that's why obviously there are all these data sharing policies. But then on the other hand, when you deal with this multiplicity issue, you know, and I read that article with all the <coughs> multiplicities, like then it just seems like there's this world of hidden multiplicities if you have this huge data set, and then you can, like you said, acknowledge it's exploratory. None of this obviously was pre-specified because now we're going back and doing all these other analyses. And then it almost seems like, well, what's the point? If there's so much multiplicity that if we find something in all these kind of secondary analyses that then have to be confirmed later anyhow, and we have all this, you know, we acknowledge that this isn't generalizable, you know, like that statement that you just read out. Well, then it almost seems so I have a hard balancing that. So how, how do you? So it's, I, I think the exploratory study we have slaughter data set is a really easy <coughs> situation. You're doing some hypothesis generating, some study question generating, practically looking at the data. I think if you go into it with saying, I'm going to look at the data this way because you've thought about it ahead of time, you're, um, I think that's a better way to approach it. Because what <coughs> I think what I would want to do mm -hmm. is have a result that I may find reasonable, but you're going to need to have this follow-up study to confirm it. And to approach it with the right track, as far as I didn't just look at all these combinations and dive in, instead I thought, okay, in this subpopulation because of such and such and such and such, and then I went and looked at the data, then I found a promising result, and then I go and design to head um, in the next study, you're going to have a better chance of actually showing in that follow-up study that there actually is a result that may be real. So I think the reproducibility is obviously a huge thing. I should, I, it's, it's a complicated situation, so you shouldn't be discouraged by actually doing this. If we never dove into our data, there would be some very interesting questions or facts and treatment that we call them for you. But you have to do it in the right context to be able to have this follow-up study to confirm the results when you go about it and it work it. So don't be discouraged by that fact. And I think it's really useful to the funding agency to say, hey, you have, you have all this data, go look at it, and you find something, tell me how you got at it. If you did 200 tests that came about, that's going to help you decide whether I want to fund this follow-up study and take a chance on it, um, that there may be an actual um, association going on actually with that. Robin, do you want to? So, um, 
drive action in a major way and have implications for a lot of people, then you should test it in a replicated study of what brings it into practice and guidelines. Uh, but everything else is still uh, is still knowledge and not just in some nether state that can't be used yet. Did you work here with me? <laughs> <laughs> Alright. Um, sorry, you don't need to reveal that. Um, Alright. The uh, just two points we have our we have a probably a fairly quick session with our small groups. The goal here is to quickly kind of touch base about human subjects protection plans and whether or not you will be needing IMDs or IDEs. Um, we'll be back up here around 12.15 for lunch. Um, in addition, faculty, please click on those links in the, bot, in the, in the uh, agenda to see if people have signed up for Sign Up Geniuses with you for the afternoon. And some of them are going fast and furious. Um, so just you know, click on the links and you'll be able to see who signed up with you. Um, a lot of people are meeting down in the lobby at that big long table, kind of like the speed dating thing. Um, and then also, 